Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. Welcome to Lincoln. We're live. We're here every Sunday morning from 10 until 11. And as usual, we have a, a great guest for you this morning. The first half of the show, we've got uh, Joy Dinger and Peter Osborne from the American Cancer Society. The second half of the show, we've got David Pepper, County Commissioner David Pepper. We want to talk about the jail tax, the Hamilton County jail tax. And I know you've got a lot to say about that. This month, September is American Cancer Month. Is that correct? And, oh, cancer um, yeah, Awareness Month, yes. Cancer Awareness Month. And I tell you, we've got every day you hear of someone coming down with breast cancer, colon cancer, and, and I, I know we're working hard to find a cure for those cancers, but what uh, this morning we want to talk about some uh, big facts and figures as to who gets cancer the most and what neighborhoods and what areas of, of the country. And here in Cincinnati alone, uh, it, cancer affects the African-American community probably in greater numbers than the white community. Why is that? Uh, could you give us an answer to that? Well, one, uh, key ac one key point that the American Cancer Society is stressing these days is the access to care issue and the fact that uh, some people in the minority community just don't have the access to care issue that uh, others do. And that's not, not true only for minorities. That's true for um, other races as well. And so there are certain cases and with, with certain cancers where the cancer is more likely to be, to be caught later on when it's doing more damage and that can cause a problem because it, has, it causes a higher mortality rate and that uh, is certainly the issue for certain minorities and, and Joy and I were talking about this mor that right. this morning. Now uh, as far as breast cancer, I know you hear a lot about that, it seems like they're catching breast cancer a lot earlier now and a lot of women are surviving breast cancer. Thank goodness to mammography, yes the breast cancers are being caught much earlier. But to kind of continue on with the minority issue, in the African-American population, uh, breast cancer is still a big problem, even when caught early for the American can uh, African American woman. Okay, now you say it's still a big problem, it's even if you catch it early, well, why is that? From the standpoint of um, some of the problems with cancer in the African-American population are due to biology. Uh, women, African American women, tend to get breast cancer earlier than white women, and it tends to be more resistant to uh, treatment. Therefore, it's even more important that an African American woman begins screening either when they should, which is 40, every woman age 40 should have a yearly mammogram, or even earlier, should discuss it with her health care provider to get screening earlier. Now, I have heard of cases where the mammogram totally misses the cancer. That happens sometimes. The mam uh, mammograms aren't perfect. They do miss about 10% of cancers because of dense breast tissue or other things that are going on. That's why it's important also to have a yearly uh, physician exam mm -hmm. and also women should do breast self-exam, should talk to their physicians about doing monthly breast self-exam. Uh, son uh, sonograms are becoming more popular in women with dense breast tissue for that reason, to try to uh, be sure everything that is there is recognized. Uh, now, are there any other uh, symptoms of breast cancer that women can look for other than, you know, the direct examination or anything like that? Are there any other symptoms that pop up that you might say, hey, you better check this out? The most common is a lump, is mm -hmm. feeling a lump. There are some other symptoms, um, a change in the skin over the breast, a change in the nipple, um, the size, the shape, the direction, uh, a change in one of the things that a woman should do when they do breast health exam and one of the things that the physicians do when they examine a woman's breast is ask them to lift their arms up over their head to see do the breast rise and fall both in symmetry. So those are some other um, symptoms. Okay. All right, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back. If you've got questions, the phone number 513-381-3838. 513-381-3838. We're talking cancer this morning for the first half of the show. Second half, we'll talk to David Pepper, county commissioner, about the Hamilton County jail tax that'll be on the ballot in November. We'll take a quick break, and we'll come back and talk to you right here on Lincoln Wear Live. We'll be back in a moment.
We're back live, Lincoln Ware. Live is the program. We're here every Sunday morning from 10 until 11. We're talking uh, cancer this morning. Uh, we talked about breast cancer uh, the last uh, uh, segment. This segment, let's talk about colon cancer. You hear a lot of incidents of colon cancer. People are starting to get the colonoscopy uh, a lot more than they used to. I guess you can thank Katie Keurig for that and the others. Uh, what about that? I, I guess African Americans suffer more from colon cancer than anyone else also. I tell you, it's tough to be a black man in America, I tell you. Well, overall, colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer behind only lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is that it's an entirely preventable disease because with a colonoscopy, you can go in and have the doctor take um, an exam and he can ca snip off this precancerous growth that's right. called a polyp. Yeah. And that'll prevent the, col the colon cancer from developing in the first place. But uh, in minority communities, such as African-American communities, it, it has an even higher rate than it does in uh, Caucasian communities. Right now, I, uh, let's see, when I turned, I guess, 52 or so, I had the colonoscopy, and they yeah. found two polyps. They cut them off. So, but my doctor says, you don't wait 10 years. You need to go back five years since they found two polyps on there. Uh, why is that, I guess? Because you, they know you are a polyp former, mm -hmm. that puts you in a little bit higher risk group than the average population, and so you need to have your colonoscopy more frequently. For the average population, starting at 50, you should have had your first colonoscopy yeah, I know, at I waited 50. two years, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> and <laughs> then if everything is clean at 50, yeah. then it's every 10 years. Yeah. But if polyps are found, then it is more, fr it is, um, more frequent. Um, individuals that have family members that have had colonoscopies and have had polyps need to get screened a little more frequently mm -hmm. as well. And then if you've had a family member that has colon uh, cancer or had colon cancer, then your screening needs to be even more, mm -hmm. even more frequent because than that. Because you have a higher risk rate. Right. Okay, now what about, this is the big one in the African American community, especially when it comes to African American men. We're talking prostate cancer. That's huge. It's huge in the African American population, right. There is a bigger incidence. Um, don't know exactly why, again, something with the biology where African American men are at more risk for prostate cancer. And it's, it's high, I mean, it's, almost, it's more than double in the white population. And therefore, most men, uh, the recommendation is that you start screening at 50 in the African American population that gets bumped up often 40. to, yes, mm -hmm. often to 40. And African American men really need to be talking to their physicians about when they, when they hit the 40 mark, you right. know, what about that? Especially if your father has... Especially, yes, yeah. especially if family you have a family member, connection. right? Father or brother, or even grandfather. And so they should definitely get the screenings done. And you hear a lot about this uh, in the black community. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Center for Closing the Health Gap, uh, Dwight yeah. Tillery. Yes. Sure. yes, They have a lot of fairs they put on and uh, promote uh, prostate screenings. And uh, so... We have a lot of volunteers who are... Um, eager to spread the word about getting tested for prostate cancer as well. There's one organization that's uh, affiliated with the American Cancer Society. I think it's called PERT, Prostate Education Research and Training, I think, run by a gentleman named Herschel Chalks. So, yeah, I know Herschel. He's been on my show before. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Herschel's a great advocate for people getting screened for prostate cancer, and we have to do everything we can to let the community know about that. Now, are there numbers people can call if they just want to volunteer, if they want to uh, uh, just talk to you about... Yes, is there a yes, yes, and yes. We have, uh, we have uh, a national call center. It's, the number is 1-800-ACS-2345. And you can call that number for the American Cancer Society to find out how to volunteer. If you want to get information on prostate cancer screenings, you can call and ask about that. If you want to find out where you can get a colonoscopy, you know, call that number. Mm -hmm. Find out where to get a mammogram. And the number is 1-800-ACS-2345 and you can uh, talk to somebody on the other line who knows about your cancer and he can get you some local resources. We also have a great website. It's called www.cancer.org and cancer.org is full of all kinds of information about American Cancer Society support programs, fundraisers, and information on different types of cancers. So we have a lot of resources available to the community. Now what if a person does not have any medical insurance but they need to get checked out? Can you lead them to the right people that can, you know, Give sure. Them some, some either, type of, uh, either through those, the phone number that I mentioned or the website cancer.org. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, we also have people in the community called patient navigators, and their job is to help people find resources in the community to help them navigate their cancer journey. Mm -hmm. And so the patient navigator is also available through that same number. If you call the national number, number, they'll connect you to the patient navigator here in Hamilton County. Her name is Julie Behan, okay. and she can find local resources for folks to try to get those screenings. 
All right, let's go to the telephones. And I didn't understand that name, but Queen. Queen, how are you? I'm fine. How are you all this morning? We're doing great. great. Okay, that's good. I have a question about colon, the colon cancer, as well as my father passed the colon cancer. So uh, I do get screened, but what happened is uh, when I had screening, I waited for four years, and I shouldn't have, I know. They told me every two years at least. But what I'm saying is that this last one I had, uh, I guess about six, seven months ago, and he uh, found three polyps. Now, I'm wondering about that, that he removed three polyps and everything. What is that? Uh, just, you know, uh, how long do they stay in if you don't get that? About how long can they be in you before they really turn into in anything? Into cancer? Yes, yeah, before okay. they turn into cancer or something. All right, thanks for your call. Hang up and listen to okay. the answer. Thanks. Yeah, Do you we, know the answer to that? Well, we really don't know, okay? okay? We really don't know how long they can stay in you until they turn into cancer. But the recommendation for having a colonoscopy, for again, for the general population, an individual that doesn't have any risk factors, is every 10 years because it's thought that if um, from start, from the time a polyp begins, it would take about 10 years for it to cause any problem. Now, again, that's the general population, not in people with a family history. And individuals that have polyps are known to have polyps. When they remove a polyp, there could be something, you know, um, just starting to form and that they can't see at the time, that hasn't really surfaced yet, and so they don't like you to go 10 years. Mm -hmm. They want you to get screened more frequently so they can catch that polyp as quickly as yeah. possible. That's why, I mean, I guess my doctor said five years right. instead of 10. Right. Okay. Right. And are there any cases where they say, well, maybe two years instead of five, you know? Right. They, they do. If you have a polyp, and depending on what the pathology of your mm -hmm. polyp was when uh -huh. they remove it, because they always remove them, they send them to the, the lab to see what kind of cells are in them, mm -hmm. if anything looks abnormal, and depending on what that outcome is, determines, too, how frequently you should have another colonoscopy. All right. All right, the phone number, 513-381-3838. If you've got questions about uh, uh, any support for cancer, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 breast cancer survivors, and they have a lot of organizations out there. Uh, how would a person find out about those organizations? Well, um, again, through our uh, website and our phone number, cancer.org and 800-ACS-2345, we can get you in touch with uh, breast cancer support activities. We have a program here, um, well, actually it's throughout the country, but we have a program that's available here in Hamilton County called Reach to Recovery, where mm -hmm. women who are diagnosed with breast cancer can be put in touch with another woman okay. who was diagnosed with a similar kind of breast cancer, and she has survived it. So the newly diagnosed woman gets to talk to the woman who's been through it, and she gets mm -hmm. to talk to her about what the treatment is like and you know what kind of questions she should ask her doctor and what's it going to be like mm -hmm. to go through chemotherapy. And so the American Cancer Society has uh, quite a few um, support volunteers who are available to help out um, uh, breast cancer patients. Okay. We also have a big walk to raise awareness and funding for breast cancer. It's called Making Strides Against Breast Cancer. And that's going to be October 14th at Yatemans Cove. And again, you can find out more about that by going to cancer.org. Now, that's a big walk you're having down there? Yes. Okay, what's the date on that again? October 14th. Is that on a Saturday or Sunday? It's, it's Sunday morning. Sunday morning, okay. Yeah. It starts at the, all festivities start at 8 o'clock, but the walk actually starts at 9. And it's a pretty big walk. Every year we get about, between about eight and 10,000 people down mm -hmm. there, and we walk uh, across the river and then back uh, to Yatemans Cove, and we raise usually about uh, five or six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to help breast cancer patients. All right, uh, we'll get back to the telephones in just a second as soon as we can. <laughs> the, we'll take a break. The phones are jumping off the hook. We'll take a break and we'll come right back and answer your questions on any type of cancer you have a question about right here on Lincoln Wear Live. We'll take a quick break and we'll return right after these messages back in a moment. Lincoln Wear Live is a program. Coming up in just a few minutes, David Pepper, County Commissioner, Hamilton County Commissioner. We'll talk about the upcoming jails tax that'll be on the November ballot. We'll talk about some of the programs involved in the tax 
and things like that. So I know you've got plenty of questions for David, and uh, he'll be in here uh, shortly. We've got calls on the phone. Let's go to, uh, let's start it off with Diane. Diane, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Pretty good. Great. Okay. I was, had a question. Since the American community is a higher risk for the uh, colon cancer, does the American Cancer Society offer financial assistance in getting colonostomy? And if so, what are the eligibility requirements? And are there any prerequisites necessary for the fulfillment of uh, being eligible? Okay. Well, the American Cancer Society does not offer, you know, a check or cash to help people get colonoscopies because we have found that the way that we can, ha we, we can help the most possible number of cancer patients throughout the country is to provide support services and to support community programs that offer colonoscopies. However, if you do call our uh, phone number, 800-ACS-2345, we can get you in touch with places that do offer colonoscopies locally, and we, we can also uh, refer you to a patient navigator in your community who can help you find community resources that might be able to get uh, um, uh, low-cost access to, colon to uh, colonoscopies. All right. Excellent. Good. Thanks hey, so th much. Thanks for your call. All right. All right, let's go to uh, King, I believe. King. Hello. Hello. Yes, how are you? Okay, my name is Jean. Jean, okay. K-E-A-N. Where did I hear the K from? So go ahead, go ahead, Jean. Oh, no. uh, go ahead. I have a question to ask. I had polyps burnt out of my colon uh, in 03, and uh, I was just wondering, does it, come, does it play a part as in not chewing your food up real good? And uh, the, just falling into your uh, colon and laying there? I didn't understand. Can you repeat okay, that? The, she, okay. I guess she's not a, a real chewer. She swallows her food unchewed, and she that, thinks it yeah. goes right there to the colon. Uh, the, I think the stomach probably digests it, you know. <laughs> right. The, the, well, first off, I didn't have any teeth. Okay. And I was eating a lot of popcorn and stuff, and... Um, I did have to go to the hospital, and they gave me a bunch of dye, and then they took x-rays of me, mm -hmm. and, you know, I had to go to a gastrologist, which is on Vernon Place in Avondale, and that's where I got the polyps burnt out of my colon. Okay. And not chewing your food really wouldn't have any bearing to the polyps. Um, we're still learning a lot about what makes polyps form, but one of the things that we do know is that diet's high in roughage, therefore, so you are decreasing um, the amount of time of the passage uh, of food through the colon. That is a uh, good thing. That's a ben of benefit. So some inflammation goes on with um, linked to polyp formation, and again, just individuals, um, different biology has some factors bearing on it, but I've not heard anything about chewing of food being a factor. Hey, thanks for your call. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to Tina. Tina, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Lincoln, and to your guest. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I want to ask a question about breast cancer. Um, some women develop a, a lump in their breast because of calcium deposits, and I'd like to know the potential of a lump like that in your breast uh, developing into cancer, and I'll hang up and listen. Thanks for your call. Um, calcium deposits are something, or is the big thing that mammography picks up, and sometimes when there are calcium deposits, it does indicate that there is some malignant cells there, and sometimes it doesn't. The best way to find out, off, usually they do a biopsy, and that tells you, is it um, malignant, you know, is it not? All right, uh, got time for maybe one or two more quick calls. Uh, Tasha, real quick, how are you? I'm fine. Good, what's your question? Okay, I was asking about the cancer. It says so many different cancer. Like, I lost a sister a year ago due to cancer. She got sick, and then, like, within a week, she passed away. Then doctors never did tell us what kind of cancer it was. They said it could be something from over across the sea. So I was just wondering, do you ever, do you heard of that kind of cancer before? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of your question. And I was just wondering, um... Is that rare? I mean, she, she was diagnosed with cancer and she died a week later. What right. kind of cancer? Yeah, did they ever tell you what type? Well, they, we were supposed to have seen the doctor that same day, but she had passed away. It said there's only one doctor in the world that knew about it. But nobody still never told us anything about it. Hmm. There are, 
it, it's hard to say because there are so many different kinds of cancers. There are just uh, you know dozens and I think even hundreds of different right. types of cancers. So I think we would need to know. It would be helpful if right. the doctor could tell you what type of cancer that was. And so. apparently they never told her. Well, look, uh, Joy Dinger and Peter Osborne, you've been a wealth of information this morning. Thank you for having and, us. And uh, we're going to throw that number up once again if we can. Can we put that number up so people can uh, get a hold of them? There's a number up on the screen if you want to call them, 1-800-ACS-2345. Joy, Peter, thanks for joining me this morning. Thanks for You're having welcome. us. Thanks Pre for having us. Appreciate you coming. Let's take a quick break and we'll come back and talk to David Pepper about the jail tax coming to Hamilton County November in no on the November election. We'll talk to him and you can call up right now, 513-381-3838 if you want to talk to David Pepper, County Commissioner. Back in a moment. We're back live, Lincoln Wear Live is the program. My guest for the second half of the show, none other than County Commissioner David Pepper. David, welcome to the Thank show. You. I think this back. is the first time you've been to the new studio. Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay, well, good to have you here. Everybody's talking on, you know, talk shows all around the city. Everybody's talking about the Hamilton County jail tax. They're talking about Simon Lee's partnering with two Democrats, something never heard of before. And uh, I tell you, the one selling point that's got me on the jail tax is the, the programs. And I think if you explain more about the programs that goes along with this tax, a lot of people are saying, well, the, uh, they're not going to have enough money to fund the programs, and uh, then all we'll be stuck with is a, uh, a jail. How can you assure people that these programs will be put in place and they'll be funded? Absolutely. First, we've uh, set it up conservatively, so we won't, we won't have the problems of the past where you, where you haven't accounted for your, what you need to spend on one part and people worry that we then have to spend money for the programs on the jail. We're setting it up so it's conservative. We won't have that problem. Secondly, though, we'll be creating separate funds so that you can't have the spillover uh, onto the jail operations from the okay. programmatic parts. Um, but what you said is very important. There is a very big difference between last November and what we're proposing. Last November was only to build a jail. It wasn't even to operate that jail. It was just to build a jail. I don't support a jail-only approach. I think that's a mistake. I think if all we do is build one other building and nothing else, we're not really solving anything. Seventy percent of the people who go through our system are reoffending. The average person is reoffending within about three weeks, 22 days. So that's a system that's completely failing. Uh, we can't just build another building. We have to actually get to the heart of the issue, which is why are people getting into the system? We've got to solve that in all sorts of ways. And why are people who go through the system, what are we failing to do so that when they get out, they can actually achieve a, a normal law-abiding life and get on with it for their families and the community? And so that's why we're putting into place a whole series of reforms. It's not just a program here, a program there. It's reforming the whole system so people, as they come in, they are, they are interviewed and assessed so people understand is it an underlying issue with mental illness? Is it uh, some short-term economic stress? Is it... Um, substance abuse, and then from the very beginning, either they get diverted because it's a nonviolent offender who doesn't need to be sitting around in jail, or they get, as they serve their 30, 60 days or longer, we begin the transition and deal with that underlying root cause so that when they get out, we've greatly reduced the chance of them reoffending. That's the approach we're doing. One of the things that we have to do if that's going to be successful, in addition to the programmatic parts, is get them out of facilities we have today, which are nothing more than just old warehouses. Mm -hmm. We have one place called Queensgate. Now, there's a big debate about whether or not it's a good place right. or not. It's an old 100-year-old warehouse. In that warehouse, we stick people with substance abuse issues and mental illness issues right next to hardened crim criminals who are waiting for serious trials. We don't give them the treatment they need, but they get an education on how to be a serious criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then 60 days later, they get out, and we scratch our heads when they all commit a worse crime than the one they had committed before. And now, we, we, need to get out, we need to get out from under these sort of warehouse facilities so that when people come in, particularly with nonviolent offenses, when they're 19 or 20, they haven't, their fate isn't determined if they're going to have a life of crime or not. But we have a system that actually pushes them more towards a life of crime than gets them back on their feet into something and good. A lot That's of people what we're that proposing. Are in, a lot of people that are in jail now, are, a lot of them are mental, mental cases. And with the programs you plan to set up, you're going to really deal with the mental aspect of this whole thing? Because I, I see a lot of people that are in jail 
not because they're criminals, but because they have a mental illness and they've done something to, to get arrested for doing well, it. Well, two things. One, we have a mental health levy on the ballot that provides a lot of money for that, and I support that. I hope mm. the community will support that. But two, to the extent that people who are coming through are, do have mental illnesses, and it's a growing number. It's a number that's also a result of the fact that the state has cut back on, uh, on support for, for permanent mental health facilities. Yeah, we're doing a lot of things in this that, that allow for better treatment of people with mental illnesses. One is the, the first part I mentioned. The earlier you assess folks when they come in, the less time you're wasting so you don't have someone with mental illness just sitting around in jail for weeks waiting for trial or waiting for someone to figure out that they have a mental illness. Uh, we also want to do things like expand the mental health court. Uh, right now we have a court that is it's like the drug court. It specifically deals with people with mental illnesses, but it's very narrow in who gets to be eligible. It's very narrow in the number of people who go through, far fewer than, than the people we know need that, that special kind of treatment. We also will add more mental health beds for those who have to be in a jail facility because of particular reasons. We also, though, provide money for programs for mental illness beyond being in jail. Mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can treat somebody, and critics of our plan say this, I agree with them, they just haven't read our plan. If you can treat someone outside of a jail, it's better. If they don't have, if, we don't, if they don't have to be in jail because they're a danger to the community or they haven't committed a, a, a serious crime, and we can get them out into a non-jail treatment program, it's better. But can you get and them we to show have up money. for the, you right. Right. that's the thing, get them to show up for the treatment it, or you know, if you've got them in jail, they don't have a choice but right. to be here for the treatment. And one of the things that people need to realize, because we hear this all the time, if people were just going to show up for treatment, they'd show up for treatment. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with people who haven't showed up for mm -hmm. treatment, and then they commit a crime. And, the, and, and treatment is tougher sometimes than a short jail sentence, or a no jail sentence because it's too crowded. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and studies show this, the best way to get someone to choose drug court or to choose drug treatment or to choose mental illness treatment is that the alternative is a jail sentence. So when you have an overcrowded system, people never choose the treatment because their lawyers say, it's overcrowded, you don't have to worry about that. So one of the counterintuitive things that's actually happening is people don't choose, we can't force treatment, but people aren't choosing treatment because we don't have the alternative sanction, which is that they have to spend time in jail. Well, uh, now, if you've got the city, sort of the county, sort of divided. You've got one group of people say, let's just build a jail and lock them up. We need more room for the jail. Uh, right. Then you've got another uh, uh, side saying, well, uh, a lot of people in jail don't need to be in jail. They arrest people for a little thing like the marijuana laws, putting extra people in there. And, and we really don't need a jail if you let some of the nonviolent criminals out, put them on home arrest uh, uh, and things like that. So how do, you, how do you get both sides balanced out here? I think by proposing what we proposed. I think most citizens in the county and in the city agree that we need enough law enforcement, you need enough jail space, but you also need enough treatment and prevention so you don't have the kind of recidivism rate we're seeing, the number of reoffenses we're seeing, and the number of young people getting caught in the system. So we've pr provided a common sense balance. Enough jail space to last us 30 years so we don't have early releases, but also enough reform and enough um, prevention and treatment so we don't have this, this terrible trend we have of a revolving door where people go in and out, in and out. They wa we waste their entire life without fixing the problem, and we waste a whole lot of money in the process. Now, we do have a challenge. You know, some people on the far right say what they said last November. We only want a jail. Mm -hmm. Anything but a jail, they say, is a liberal social program, and they're against it. But if you and close you have down a, the other facilities, like you say you're going to close down, I haven't figured it out, but we got some people that sit there and their whole life they figure these things out. They say if you close the other facilities like Queensgate and others, that we really won't be adding that many uh, jail cells. We're adding 800, which is a large number. And see, and I've that, heard it down as low as 100. Right. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> so it's an amazing debate. All I can tell you is, and in, in one of the people who keeps saying it's 100 is Commissioner Pat DeWine. <laughs> well, last year he supported adding 1,800 under the same terms as we are now, and he said it was 800. Mm -hmm. So when he was for it, it was 800, and he's against it, it's 100. He's, he says he's against it because we've actually gone beyond just building a jail. We are actually doing the reforms and the treatment and the prevention we know will make it so we don't have to build more jails later. He, w he didn't do that last year. He's not for this plan. All of a sudden, his numbers are changing. But uh, you can, you know, I can just tell you it's adding 800 new beds. Mm -hmm. um, it's replacing a whole lot of beds that don't serve us very well because people, as I said, are getting thrown into a warehouse amid serious criminals 
these nonviolent offenders are getting an education on how to be a more serious criminal and not getting the treatment they what need. What I don't like about this that we're spending millions of dollars in other counties. We're we're help we're padding other counties' budgets. Right. Sending our prisoners over there, paying these hefty uh, uh, daily rates for jail space. Uh, I believe even Kentucky offered us a better deal, right. but I don't know if you guys are looking into that. Sometimes that. we are, yeah. but it's all short term. I mean, yeah. the idea that we're solving this problem just by renting to other places, that we're really solving it is, is very short-sighted. It's why we're stuck where we are now. These other places are going to need their beds back in the next couple of years. We're shipping 8 to 10 million bucks a year up to Butler County. Now, in the, ne in the meantime, I guess that's better than early releases. But long term, when I hear people say, well, this is the, this is the future, they're not having, you know, they were going to raise their tax in Butler County until we bailed them out. Yeah, yeah, time. see, that, that's what I don't like. I Let's, go to, okay. Let's go to the telephone. Let's go to the telephone. Heba, Hava, I believe that's your Jose. name. Jose. Jose, how you doing? Hey, how you doing, man? Pretty good. Man. Uh, I got a comment. I was down in the park, right? Down in Washington Park? Yes. And I was sitting on the, on the, on the park bench like I do some Sundays because I live in Norwood now, but I'm formerly from... Um, Avondale, and I was just sitting there drinking a juice and um, having me something to eat, right? So I saw the dozed off. So the cop came up to me, man, and he asked me, he said, are you here for this dog show? Which they were having a dog show. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because the other cop was going to arrest me, right? And so? And, and so what I'm saying is, I could have went to jail for a little or nothing, yeah. and I would have been in jail. And, and then put back out on the street. I see a lot of my friends that's down at the drop in other places go to jail and come out, go to jail, come out, and they be having people down there surveying, talking about, do we need another jail? I think they need jobs and things for people, but for a lot of middle people and stuff, they don't have nowhere to go, yeah. nothing to do, you know, and it's, it's really sad because they go in jail, and like, like that man say, they become to be other criminals and, and, and going to better line of crime and all because they have nowhere to go and and they be sitting out in the park on a sunday in the city and the cops come through there and they harass them like something awful all right hey thanks for your call now and and a lot of people say you know they're arresting more and more people so the jail will be crowded and so when november comes around we'll be shipping prisoners out of here because we don't have room and people will vote for the jail tax could that be uh, happening if it is it's obviously a complete waste uh, the the I think the gentleman, Jose, I think it was, is, is absolutely right that we have, if we can find someone a better path because they get the job training they need and the job they need, mm -hmm. in addition to helping them make their life better, which is good for all of us, the savings from that path versus paying for them to stay in jail is enormous. Mm -hmm. So we're working very hard as part of this plan. Uh, it, we have begun a criminal justice commission, and there are committees on that dedicated to one is about reentry. How do we find people who are caught up in the system? How do we get them connected to job training? How do we get it? How do we figure out some of the legal problems that some of these folks deal with, where because of different issues they can't get a driver's license, which would be allow them to get to the job so they don't go back into the right. system? We're dealing with all these issues, and, and we have to because to, again, if people end up in jail because they couldn't find a job for too long, uh, I don't. I don't agree that even if they can't do that, they should commit a crime. But you know what? Some people will. Or some people will get caught up in something bad, and all of a sudden, they're spending a life in jail. That's a lot more expensive to taxpayers and a lot worse for them, obviously, than, than, than if we do something smart around reform and get them on the path through the job center or something else so they get a job and can make a living. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and take more of your calls. 513-381-3838, Lincoln, we're live. County Commissioner David Pepper is my guest. We'll come back and let you talk to him right after this break on It's 38, back in a moment. And we're back live, Lincoln, we're live with you. My guest this morning, County Commissioner David Pepper. We're talking about the jail tax. It'll be on the ballot in November. We'll take your calls. Let's go to Hakeem. Hakeem, how are you this morning? Hey, Link, how are you? Pretty good. Oh, how are you, uh, Mr. Pepper? I'm great. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, I'll call, you know, uh, give my uh, opinion on uh, about the uh, jail. Don't you think that uh, there could be an uh, alternative, like if they did some upgrading on their uh, home incarceration program with a person uh, and some minor, you know, uh, mischief, where they won't be hindered from working, 
you know, at, uh, and they can still be, you still know. Still have the program. I, you know, that's what, yeah. I don't think they use home incarceration enough. Right. I think, you know, hire a few extra people, buy a few at more hundred units, mm -hmm. and you save that jail space. Right. We can do that. Here's the, the reality is that it's, it's a great option. It's something we should explore using more. Uh, some people who have a little more means will actually pay a little bit to, to benefit from, from not being in jail mm -hmm. doing that, and then they can work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're looking at all those options and we'll use them. The demand for space over the next 30 years, though, is going to be even more than we can, you know, a lot of these reforms are good ones, mm -hmm. but by doing them, we will lower the increase in the amount of jail space by, by an important amount. But we won't eliminate it entirely. We also want to eliminate the need to get rid of like the warehouse facilities that don't do anyone any good. So we need more jail space for 30 years. But we also, and this is the point, if we don't do all these other things that, that Hakeem and others are suggesting, we'll need even more than we're building. Mm -hmm. So we have to do both. But it doesn't eliminate the need entirely, although it helps a lot. And, and the difference between the plan this year the one last year is we're looking at and beginning to do a lot of these things. This early intervention I mentioned, where we assess people as they come in the door, we've already started that. It's already working. Mm -hmm. our, our numbers for those we're intervening with are already better than they were. Now, we can only pay for this if the plan can t is, is funded through November's election. But uh, we're doing these things, and we have to do them. And, and ideas like his and others are exactly the kind of things we'll be pursuing. Now, if if we go the other path, you know, the Pat DeWine, Chris Finney path, all we do is build a jail and nothing else. Nothing else. And Just we don't jail. solve anything. And I'm telling you, if all we do is build a jail, nothing else, we're building jails forever because we aren't lowering the amount of people who are getting back on their feet. All right, let's go to Linda. Linda, good morning. How are you? Linda. Yeah. Linda. Linda, you got to wake up, baby. You out of here. Let's go to DJ. DJ, how you doing? I'm fine, and you? Good. I'm better than fine. I'm blessed. Well, that's good. good. Um, my, my thing is, I just want to say I am voting no, and I'm encouraging everybody else to vote no. I've been a Justice Center nurse. I've been a pillar of the community. I don't have any faith in the commissioners. Instead of worrying about putting a horse before the car, court, cart, I'm sorry, uh, putting a jail before preventative measures and things like that. You all don't come up with things to help people before it becomes an issue that they should need to go to jail. Okay, so hold on, hold on right there, DJ. Now, how do you convince her to vote yes for it after well, what she just uh, said? I, I appreciate her. Can you prevent her. me to vote yes? How can he get you to vote yes? Uh, for what the commissioners to be men of their word, don't say good things when they're campaigning, and then disappear with those things. You're no better than the criminals. So in other words, you don't believe what he's saying about the programs and things like that that's going to help? I voted for him to get in, and he has not kept his word. He has not returned my phone calls. No, he should not be in office with the rest of them because he doesn't keep his word. Where is the faith for us? to keep putting our money into people that don't keep their campaign promises. All right, thanks for your call. She and has no I, faith in I, you. Apparently not. <laughs> I, I'll just say that I, um, I, I was very clear last year that I wanted to deal with the root causes of crime but also solve this, this crisis, and that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting the cart before the horse. I'm doing everything at the same time. Before we propose this plan, uh, prior in the year, and it's already beginning, at least the, the bid proposal is, we pr propose that we deal with uh, intervening with every high school dropout. We know what's happening. If people drop out of high school, mm -hmm. we know they're ending up in our justice system too yep. often. Okay. So even before we propose this approach, we already started dealing with that issue, which is a key prevention issue. This is not like last November. The jail is not more important than the, than the programming and reforms. They're in the same package. So this is actually exactly what I said I would do. It's why I disagreed with uh, Phil Heimlich when he said he didn't care about the root cause of crime. I said I did and I do, and that's why our approach handles both at the same time. That's why it's, it's so fundamentally different and, and so much, I think, superior to the other solutions, which are to only to build a jail. We have to do both. And, and one of the things that I think people uh, need to understand is the status quo is what's not working. The status quo is the failed system of a revolving door that's costing right. everyone a ton of money and that leads to high crime, which we've got, and, you, and the recidivism rate. And you hear the cops say, well, you know, these people, I, I arrest them, bring them in, and they're out before the I finish the paperwork. A, and and when I, I, I understand DJ and others' frustration, but the frustration is with the current system. And what we get, we don't pass this thing in November, is the same current system, the same 100-year warehouse, the same set of programs, the same approach. 
we're proposing a new, a better way. So in other and, words, DJ, do you want the same old, same old, or do you want to try to get some programs in there with more jail space to help this problem? That's, yeah, I that's, guess that's, that's, that's a very that's clear right choice there. we face. And, and like I said, we've already begun, again, cart before the horse, we haven't built any new jail space, but we've begun the intervention with those who are coming in the jail now. We've right. already put the money there, and, and we will only be able to continue that with the plan. So the intervention prevention side is the, is the first thing we did out of the gate. The Criminal Justice Commission has already begun its work. Next week, we'll be, I hope, endorsing the expansion of the mental health court to deal with people with mental that, illnesses. That, that's a good we deal. also will be proposing something called a certificate of rehabilitation where those who do what we ask them to do as a community, to rehabilitate themselves, get a stamp of approval so they can go get the jobs and get the other opportunities that we know they need to get on the right track. Jeff. We've already worked on these yeah. issues. Go ahead, Jeff. How are you? I'm all right. Hey, I was giving you a call. What happened to the system of having basically, like you used to have years ago, uh, you have a work release program where people who get employment, if you get arrested, you got employment, hey, you keep your job, mm -hmm. you pay the county for that be able to yeah. leave, go to your job, you come back and report there at night, you sleep there, you go back to work for the, to serve your time up that way. That way everybody gains in it. Why don't they have that with the Talbot they, House or They something? have some of that, but, but Jeff's right that that was cut back mm -hmm. on, in the last 10 years. I don't know the exact history of it, and it's another thing we are, we are going to explore expanding or, or doing again because I know work release for a lot right. of people the makes more sense. The guy gets arrested sense. for something that's crazy. Right. He stays in jail. He loses his job. Then he gets out. What does he Doesn't do? Have, and a lot of times, you know, whether uh, in child support cases, we need, you know, for the family, for them to get out of the situation, they need to be earning money. They can't earn they it can't earn in the jail, jail. bed. Yes, yeah, because so, everybody who gets arrested is not really a bad criminal, but, you know, I mean, they've just been stuck in an unfortunate predicament. You know, and, and, and the guy that needs to be in jail, that's who you keep in jail. But the guy absolutely. that has a job and trying to support families, stay off of being in jail by going to work and paying their child support, I think that'll be a good system for them. Hey, absolutely. thanks for your call. And Appreciate the, it. The point of our plan is to actually start distinguishing again between the different people you've talked about. Because right now, as I said, they all end up in the same mm -hmm. place at Queensgate, sitting around in one big room together, and it's not working. And the, and the people went in there without a lot of issues or with some underlying issues like a drug problem, are sitting around with serious criminals, yeah. and they're getting taught about right. how to be a more yeah. serious criminal. Uh, let's go to Pam. Pam, good morning. How you doing, Lincoln? Pretty good. How you doing? Yes, I'll just call to tell David Pepper that I voted against the jail, and I voted for him at, because he was a Democrat. I did not think that he would come, him and Portune would come up with a jail proposal. That this is that's what has me outraged that he even came up with the idea that after we voted against it that he's gonna come up with a better plan. That's not what people voted him in for. We got rid of Heimlich for that. Well, you got to have a plan, and you said he came up with a better plan. <laughs> so if you're gonna have a plan, as long as it's better, I guess that's not okay. A better but I, you say you voted for him because he was a Democrat. To get rid of that weed law. Well, that's a good point there. What about that marijuana law, which are putting a lot of people in jail? You look around the country. We have one of the, I guess, strictest marijuana laws uh, around the, Actually, the country. Actually, the, the truth is, it's one of the least strict if you look if you compare it to really anywhere in the country. But but that aside. We are, we are in the first, for the first time, going to study and know exactly who's in jail for, why, for what okay. and why. And if they're in there for some stupid reason, and it's taking up jail space for things that aren't really troubling to any of us, mm -hmm. then we're going to go back to whatever jurisdiction and say, listen, you have a law, you passed it for a certain reason, but look how much it's costing the system, and tell them, and it's up to each jurisdiction to make the decision. Um, because, you know, the city... Well, you're going to have sort of like an overseer yeah, to look we'll, at we'll all We'll provide the a lot. We, we'll have, after, what, after this Criminal Justice Commission, which is part of the plan, does its work, we will have much more information about who's in there for what reason. Uh, there are a lot of guesses about, oh, they're all in there for this law and that yeah, law. And I think yeah. people actually are going to find that some of the things they think aren't, aren't the a case. A breakdown of who's right. in there. The, the, Child the, support, the marijuana. The system's overcrowded. I don't think judges are, are locking up people for a long period of time for the marijuana law, which is the fourth degree misdemeanor, yeah. the least criminal level you have in our system. I think people overstate that. But even so, mm -hmm. if it turns out that people are in there for silly reasons, you bet I don't want them in there for that. If it's some, some minor thing that takes up jail space that, as Jeff said, we'd rather have a more serious criminal in there for, for a more serious crime. But I want to get back to what she said, and obviously I hear this every once in a while. Well, we voted for you because of a certain reason, and you just came back and did what Heimlich did. No. 
The citizens were right to reject what Heimlich did. It was only to build a jail. We are trying to change a status quo that is fundamentally failing, and we're trying to do it in a much more progressive way, where we're thinking through, yeah, we need enough space. We know that. But we're also dealing with the underlying causes and all the issues that, that Pam and others uh, care about. So I can only say, as you read the plan, give it, it's, it's being called, and Lincoln, you're even saying today, the jail tax. Yeah. It's not a jail tax. Okay, what is it? It, it is it a called? comprehensive safety plan. And what's it going to read on the ballot? It will, re, it will not read jail tax. It will read about <laughs> broader, people. Okay. broader reforms okay. uh, that deal with the criminal system and, and, and recidivism and youth crime. One key So piece, jail won't be mentioned in there at all? I don't think the word jail even <laughs> appears there. And, and it's because it does a heck of a lot yeah. more than yeah. just build a jail. That was last November's plan. This is very different. One big issue, we have juvenile crime shooting up. Uh, we have the number of kids with, with guns mm -hmm. skyrocketing. Oh yeah. oh yeah. One of the things in this plan that wasn't done last time was we're trying to deal with that issue. A lot of these kids are being sent up to Columbus to the, to the state system. They lose complete contact with their family, with this community, and they come back at 18 and guess what? Then they're going to be adult Dogs. criminals. We are doing more to build our local ability to deal with these youth, these high-risk youth so that we can actually get them back on the right track so they don't go into the, the, the adult system. This is intervention as well as facilities. These are things that weren't in that prior plan. And again, we're trying to be practical. Mm -hmm. We know we need enough jail space. We know we need, we need to get rid of some of the old space that doesn't work. We know we have to add over time. But we also are smart enough, to, and this is what I talked about my entire campaign. Um, we also need to go after the root causes and we have to lower the amount of people who are reoffending, and we have to help young people get on the right track by doing things like we're doing, intervening with high school dropouts. If, a, if someone has caused some trouble, figuring out how to keep them from getting out of trouble again. That's what our plan does. All right, we're just about out of time. I'm, I do want to have you come back uh, one more time before November. Okay. You just about have me convinced that we need this jail tax. Uh, uh, the program the safety plan. The, okay, the safety plan right. with the programs and the added jail space. Uh, the programs is the key to this whole thing. Right. If we get the programs and we make sure we implement those programs, I think uh, it'll make life a lot better here in right. Hamilton County. So, hey, hey thank, thank you, you, David I Pepper. Appreciate it. It means a lot. And uh, we'll get you back in here before I'll November. Be and we'll also have your good friend Pat DeWine in here also. Oh, great. <laughs> Maybe That'll we can get fun. you two together. Would we, you can't come on? Be, we can't be at the same thing because uh, it's a. Uh, it's sunshine rule. Oh, that's right. That's, a that's majority. right. I'd have to have all three of you, I guess. We'd have to announce it publicly. We'd have to, oh, my goodness. Okay, well, we'll try something. But anyway, thank you for joining me Thanks. this morning. And uh, we'll have you back again before November to talk about the comprehensive uh, safety plan, plan, safety plan. Right. Uh, we'll take a break and we'll come back and wrap things up with the Talk of the Town right here on Lincoln Where Live. Back in a moment. And we're back live, Lincoln Ware Live is the program. Today coming up at noon on It's 38, how to go out on a date in Queens. I know I said that last week, but I was looking at the wrong memo. Okay, this week you will see how to go out on a date in Queens, starring Jason Alexander and Allison Eastwood. A rebroadcast of this show tonight at 8 o'clock on Channel 25, W-O-T-H. And after the rebroadcast of this show on Channel 25, Curse of the Black Dahlia, starring uh, Kate Stegall and Laura Penn. That's tonight at 9, following the rebroadcast of this show. Or you can download this show, WBQC.com. Download all the episodes of Lincoln Wear Live. And this show will be on around Tuesday. Check it out. I'm out.